In a scene straight out of a horror movie, five people, including actress Sharon Tate, were found dead at the home of Hollywood director Roman Polanski. Imagine a world of peace and love interrupted by one of the most sinister crimes in modern history. Miss Tate, who was pregnant, was found with a rope around her neck attached to another body. Now imagine one of music's biggest stars' strange and sudden involvement with the perpetrator of this horrific scene. This is the story of the Beach Boys' Dennis Wilson and his relationship with Charles Manson. In the mid-60s, the Beach Boys were revered. They were at the height of their fame, like the Beatles. The Beach Boys were a central figure in Los Angeles at this point. They were homegrown. They were one of the two biggest bands in the world. They were known for surf music, songs about cars. They were enjoying having a lot of money, having a lot of women, and living it up there in Hollywood. The Beach Boys were composed of uh, Three brothers, Brian Wilson, the genius musician, and Carl, who sang, and Dennis played drums. There was only one beach boy that ever surfed, and that was Dennis Wilson. He was the most handsome one, the most outgoing one, and uh, the wildest one by all accounts. Dennis was like the free spirit of the Beach Boys, kind of the opposite of Brian Wilson in a lot of ways. He was kind of the, the cool, you know, guy who wanted to party and do drugs and hang out with chicks and try new things. Dennis was sort of living in the shadow of Brian in a lot of ways, you know, from a the creative standpoint. I think he had an itch to prove himself, and this insane person entered his sphere and changed his life. In 1968, during the Summer of Love, Dennis Wilson is loving the life of a rock star. That is, until he happens upon a pair of hitchhikers. They tell him about their gang and their leader, a man named Charlie. They mentioned they were part of this, this group. It seemed like a group of hippies that were just, uh, you know, talking about free love. And Dennis had come on over, and uh, they essentially moved in, including Charles Manson and most of the girls. Manson could see Wilson as this sort of fun-loving guy, so he played to that part of Wilson, you know, offering up girls, drugs, and before he knew it, Charlie Manson and the Manson girls were living in his house. But unbeknownst to Dennis, Charlie is much more than a party boy. Manson desperately wanted to get into the rock and roll business. He attached himself to the right people. This is a powerful family with a lot of connections. Manson knew how to get his hooks into these people. Dennis is not only flattered, he's intrigued. He recognizes a kindred spirit in Manson, someone who shares his zest for the high life. And just like the Manson family, Dennis becomes mesmerized by Charlie's wild charisma. For whatever reason, Dennis thought Charles Manson was the wizard. Why would you think that Dennis Wilson was any less susceptible to Charles Manson? He was very manipulative, very good at it. He portrayed the love and peace thing, but I'm sure they were just taking him for a ride. He convinced Dennis that, hey man, I am the future. And Dennis bought in. Eventually, the Manson family wears out their welcome, but before they leave the Wilson home, Dennis gives the group $100,000. He also agrees to include one of Manson's songs on the Beach Boys' new album. But is this friendship? or fear. Mike Love said that Dennis Wilson saw Manson kill someone. And there's the story that Manson came up to Dennis and showed him a bullet and basically threatened his family. Dennis Wilson has Charlie Manson and some of the Manson family living in his house. He can't get them out. He's scared of them. So possibly he sort of recorded that song to get him off his back. Regardless of why, the Beach Boys cut a Manson tune in September 1968. Charles Manson actually recorded a lot of 
what now would be called like freak folk or uh, acid folk songs back in the 60s. And Cease to Exist was one that actually has a melody and sounds like a real song. Cease to exist, just come and say you love me. They deconstructed it, they took it apart, they changed the lyrics, they took apart the framework of the whole song and reworked it into a song called Never Learn Not to Love. Never had a lesson I ever learned And I know I could never learn not to love you The end result is not anything special. It's certainly not a standout in the Beach Boys catalog. I have no doubt that Dennis was freaked out, but there's also this weird, like, I feel like maybe he was trying to stick it to Manson somehow, because there's this video of Never Learn Not to Love, and there is Dennis Wilson out front making love to the camera. And, you know, I mean, Dennis Wilson's rarely out front. It's the Beach Boys, he's the drummer, you know? And so it's just so strange to me knowing the story behind it and then seeing that performance. Perhaps it's because Dennis has already paid Manson $100,000. Or maybe Dennis doesn't want to drag his brothers into the mix. But whatever their reason, the Beach Boys make a calamitous decision. Lyrics were a little different. The title was different, but, you know, for all intents and purposes, it was a Charles Manson song. Uh, they didn't give him writing credits on that song. And, you know, somebody as megamaniacal as Manson was, you can imagine how angry, to put it lightly, he might be. To calm Charlie down, Wilson sets up a meeting with Hollywood insider Terry Melcher, the son of beloved actress Doris Day and a famous record producer himself. But the meeting doesn't go as planned. Terry Melcher was kind of freaked out by Manson, tried to let him down gently. He ran up against reality in that Charles Manson was Charles Manson. Only had to really take one meeting with this guy to know that this guy is not somebody we should be working with. By the summer of 1969, Charles Manson is furious. He's felt slighted twice by the music industry. First, by the Beach Boys, who record one of his songs without crediting him. The second time is by record producer Terry Melcher, who declines to record his music. Less than a year later, Charlie extracts his horrifying vengeance. Its infamous theme is called Helter Skelter, and its first stop is at 10,050 Cielo Drive, the former home of Terry Melcher. My feeling is that Manson was going there to go after Terry Melcher. There's evidence that he had been casing the joint, had actually, you know, gone to the house at least once that we know through police records. Manson went to the house where Sharon Tate was, thinking that's where Terry Melcher lived. That's why he sent his people into that house. He was after Terry Melcher. In the aftermath of the Manson murders, Melcher seeks psychiatric care while Wilson retreats into a shell, broken off even from his brothers. The band itself is never quite the same, star-crossed by that fateful day Dennis stops his car and comes face to face with evil. I think Charles Manson left a mark on the Beach Boys, uh, primarily on Dennis. It was Dennis that really welcomed him in without any understanding, as did anyone, of, of, of what he was planning or what might happen. It was a mistake, perhaps, on Dennis's part, but a mistake made out of just that he had a loving heart. He felt somewhat responsible, but Charles Manson was a psychotic individual. Manson would have found someone else to glom onto, but that doesn't diminish, you know, the guilt that, say, Dennis Wilson felt for, you know, playing even the minutest role in what happened. And then Dennis died young, drowned. His death was tragic, and, and I think he'll always be darkened by uh, the spirit that he was one of the people that welcomed Manson in. Dennis Wilson dies in 1983. 
never speaking publicly about his relationship with one of the most notorious serial killers in history. On this season of Music's Greatest Mysteries, was KISS a brand or a band? Did the CIA kill Bob Marley? And it was then that the two carloads of gunmen came to kill Bob Marley. What happened to Graham Parsons? Graham Parsons' death is the craziest situation you could ever imagine. Was there a real rivalry between Michael Jackson and Prince? There was definitely a spirit of competition between these two. Is Post Malone cursed? What's the legend of backmasking? Do not listen to sticks because they're evil or they're devil worshippers. Who killed Sid Vicious? They're all part of music's greatest mysteries. Only on Access TV.